All right, so moving on into part two for chapter 13, we're going to talk now about neo-behaviorism, which comes immediately after behaviorism, right? Neo just means new here, so new behaviorism. But it's, it essentially refers to almost all behaviorism after what Watson proposed in his Behaviorist Manifesto. And a lot of it has to do with a new ism, new, a new philosophy here, logical positivism. So what are we talking about here? Let's back up for a second and remember what positivism is all about as a definition of science. So if we recall, it's about focusing on things that are objectively observable. And any statement that goes beyond what is observed is not really considered a scientific statement, right? If you, if you talk about what you have observed in an objective way, you're being scientific. But if you're talking about things that go beyond observation, now you get into the realm of what's oftentimes referred to as theory, right? And you might've heard the phrase before, oh, that's just a theory, as if maybe being a theory is not something that could be validated in a scientific way. Well, if you're following a strict positivist view of science, then that might in fact be a true statement. All theories are, are, are statements that have gone beyond the, the data of observation. They're more general statements, right? And that's the na nature of a theory is that uh, a description of something that you have observed in terms of data is scientific, but more general statements that go beyond the data would be unscientific at least until we get logical positivism, which is a new school of, of philosophy that emerged in the 1920s associated with a group of philosophers in, in Vienna, Austria. So they're called the Vienna Circle, uh, mainly centered around one guy, Rudolf Carnap. And, and what Carnap and these others are, are, are concerned about here is the fact that, well, we really do need to have a way in which we could make theories scientific. How can we discriminate a, a, a certain statement, a general statement about something that would be scientific versus another one that might not be scientific? So if you've had research methods, you would have learned this, even though you might not have been given the terminological positivism, but you've learned about the idea that there is such a thing as a scientific theory and there is such a thing as an unscientific theory and that you have a bunch of criteria that, that a theory has to meet in order to to count as being scientific, right? So we've talked about, you would have learned things like uh, the law of parsimony, right? A, a good scientific theory needs to be simple, not overly complex and convoluted. Uh, it also has to be logically connected to the data. And what that means is that, is that at least at face value, if you have a bunch of data, then your, your theory to explain all of it at least needs to be logically consistent, right? But there's another important part of logic here, why it's called logical positivism, and it's a term called hypothetical deduction. It's a long term, right? Hypothetical deduction. But what that really means here is that a theory as a general statement should be able to, be, to be used in a deductive way, right? That is, deductive logic is defined, go back to chapter two, we talked about that. Deductive logic is defined as reasoning from the general to the particular, right? So the theory is the general. So you should be able to reason from the theory to the particular. What's the particular in this case? It's the data. But in particular with hypothetical deduction, it's future data, meaning you make a prediction about something that you haven't observed yet, which is of course framed in the form of a hypothesis, which is why it's called hypothetical deduction. So you have a theory and then you use deductive logic to generate a hypothesis from the theory. So any theory that cannot do that, you, that doesn't allow you to generate hypotheses, would not be scientific from a, from a logical positivist perspective, right? But what's of course also important is that you actually then conduct the experiment to test the hypothesis and then ideally you're verifying the hypothesis. So the logical positivist focused on the concept of verificationism, right? Verification is the idea is that you have verifiable hypotheses that you can now generate from a theory. 
most famously, sometime after that, Karl Popper offered a rejection of verification. He said that you can never actually, that verification isn't good enough for science because, because all that you're ever doing is you're just providing evidence that supports the theory, but you haven't really proven it. And that's one of the things that you also learn in your research methods class is that you really can't ever prove a theory true. But what you can do is you can prove it false, right? You can make it, you can have a general statement. So, so you know, one of the classic textbook examples is I can make a claim, all, uh, all swans are white, right? And that's a, that's a general statement by definition. It's a reference to all swans. All swans are white, right? And I can, it generates testable hypotheses, right? It would, I can deductively say that if I view a swan, it will be white. And I can do that. And I can say, okay, there's a white swan, there's a white swan. And each one of those observations verifies my claim, but it can never really prove it true because it always leaves open the possibility that there's somewhere out there somewhere uh, a black swan that we just have not observed yet, right? Uh, and, but it's out there somewhere. And, and so while we can never prove this statement true, we can prove it false if we were to actually eventually discover the black swan. So in this uh, argument from Popper here, what we can concretely do is prove, th prove theories false. If we can find the exception, then we've proven it false. So he says that it really it, the, the hallmark of a scientific theory is that it does make a prediction not to be verified, but to be falsified. And if a theory does not enable a way in which it can be proven false, then it is not considered scientific. And so, falsification becomes the, the central issue here for, for uh, what we're not going to focus on in psychology as psychological theories. And that's a big deal for behaviorism, right? Because if you're Watson, what's a theory? A theory is a statement that goes beyond the observation of stimuli and responses, which means talking about internal psychological processes is uh, in fact, so, so well, let's use a few that we've already talked about, like intelligence, personality, emotion. Those would be psychological theories, right? We don't observe them. We can observe only responses. But then we invoke internal psychological processes to explain why people do same things the way that they do. Why are certain people consistent in the way they behave? Well, I will theorize that they have personality traits like introversion or extroversion or agreeableness or, or openness or conscientiousness, right? And by invoking those personality traits as theoretical level explanations of their behavior, um, according to Watson, that it would be unscientific because those general uh, exp explanations or constructs are, are, are not scientific, right? They're theories. But we could perhaps make it the scientific if we can be follow logical positivism. Does the theory of personality make predictions that can be falsified? And well, that's, that's a debate for a personality class, but the idea of course is that it could be uh, scientific if it met those definitions. But let's focus on the issue that's of interest to the behaviors, which is learning, right? For Watson, Watson, if you're a real strict behaviorist like Watson, you're actually not interested in learning as a psychological construct because oftentimes when we think about learning and we think about things the way Jennings talked about learning, such as th this internal psychological process that we have to climb the ladder of Morgan's canon, right? Um, well, that's a, a theoretical cl claim, right? That there's some sort of change happening inside the animal that represents the learning process, right? But Watson doesn't wanna talk about learning in that kind of way. That's a, that's, a, that's a theory level explanation of learning. As far as Watson is concerned, learning is nothing more than a change in an animal's responses over time. So it's defined purely in terms of performance, right? So le learning, uh, we don't even hardly wanna use the word learning if we're gonna be a Watson style behavior. So you just wanna talk about behavior changed, right? Um, and, and if behavior changed, we can explain it in terms of the stimulus, and that's it, right? And we're not going to call it learning because that's more of a psychological term. But we're going to go ahead and get into neo-behaviorism because the neo-behaviorists here are, in fact, going to talk about learning as a psychological construct to actually talk about the possibility 
that learning and behavior might be two different things, right? That is performance and learning, behavior and learning, right? This is where Guthrie comes in. Now, Guthrie is a little bit tricky. So we're going to talk a little bit about Guthrie, but then we're going to jump into Tolman because Tolman, I think, is a lot easier to understand than what Guthrie is talking about. There's another part of Thorndike we didn't spend much time on. So we've got the law of effect. Animals learn uh, cause and effect relationships between things, right? But Thorndike also talked about the law of exercise, that the, the, the idea is that when he puts the cats back into the puzzle box, the time it takes for them to escape is a little bit faster than the previous time. And then, of course, if he puts them back in a third time, they get out a little faster and a fourth time faster and so on and so forth. So Thorndike's talking about the fact that the strength of their learning gets stronger over time. The more often they repeat the response, uh, that the, the, the strength of the stimulus response relationships gets stronger and stronger and stronger, the more often it's performed. And that's the law of exercise. It's repeating or exercising the learning process and it makes it stronger. Guthrie is rejecting that. And he says that what's happening is that the cats learn how to escape the box the very first time they escape the box. And that's called one trial learning. And at that, the, the, the response is learned. It's it. It's done. It's, it is learned. It's in the cat, right? But the likelihood of the cat escaping the box immediately upon, upon being put back into that a second time or a third time or a fourth time increases with uh, each time, right? And so what's happening here is that the fact that the cat is escaping the box faster and faster and faster after repeated attempts doesn't mean that the learning is getting stronger. The learning is already there. It, but what it does mean, according to Guthrie, is that there's other processes at work here happening inside the cat that will determine whether the cat responds or not. And that it's those other kinds of internal processes that determine when performance occurs. It is not the presence of learning that determines that. The, the response has already been learned. But what's also happening here is that there's other factors at play that determine whether or not the cat will exhibit the learned response or not. And as any cat owner knows, cats learn all kinds of things, but they will ignore it sometimes, right? They just simply don't do what you want them to do a lot of times. What is those other kinds of internal factors that determines whether the cat will perform, will behave given a particular stimulus? Well, what that really means though, we don't know. There's a lot of this, we'll, we're gonna focus on this with, with Tolman's research, but the point here is that what Guthrie's claim is doing is it's suggesting that the actual learning process and the behaving process are separate from each other. And, and that's exactly the kind of thing that Watson would not support. Because as far as Watson is concerned, learning can only be said to occur when you observe it. And what you observe are changes in performance over time. And that you are observing that directly. To theorize that there's some other separate learning process happening behind the scenes, that's not scientific. So for Watson and the strict behaviorist approach, you only can say that learning has occurred when you observe the change in behavior, not when you don't, right? So let's have a look at, as I said, Guthrie was a little tricky. So let's talk about Tolman's research because Tolman, I think, can help us understand how it's possible that we can talk about learning occurring even when we don't see the animal's behavior change. He's studying rats in a maze. So he talks about the idea of a cognitive map, which makes a little bit of sense from a maze perspective, right? Because you think about what's the rat learning when it learns a maze? Maybe it's learning a map, right? It's got this cognitive map of where all of the corridors go, all of the turns and everything, and all the different pathways that it could possibly follow. And it learns one route on the map out of all the others, that's the successful route, right? But that's not what Watson would say, right? because that's now we're going up the ladder, right, of Morgan's Canyon. We don't want to do that. If you're Watson, what Watson is suggesting is that when the rat is faced with a junction in a maze, possibility of a left turn versus a right turn, that's just a stimulus. And the rat has learned a response to that, which is turn left or turn right. And the rat has learned a, a sequence of stimulus response relationships so that as far as the rat is concerned, it does not have spatial knowledge of the maze. It simply has learned a sequence of left and right turns, 
And that's all that the rat is able to do, is to perform a sequence of left and right turns. And in fact, early in the learning process, when faced with a junction, the rat faced with a choice, but it's never learned this maze before, essentially engages in trial and error behavior. Its behavior is random. It's like a coin flip inside the rat that says turn left or turn right, pure random. And if the left turn turns out to go to a dead end, the, the, that, that response is extinguished and the rat never t makes that left turn anymore, instead only makes right turns at that particular junction. And so over time, the rat learns the correct number of, or the correct sequence of left and right turns and eventually solves the maze. It's a pure stimulus response explanation, right, without invoking cognitive maps or anything like that. And Tolman has this idea, as we can see his theory is called cognitive behaviorism because he's more willing to invoke the possibility that there are these other things happening inside the rat that mediate its responding. And so that so-called intervening variable between the stimulus and the response is now the cognitive map. This sounds a little bit like the SOR chain from functionalism that's coming back, except that it's not just, we're not just going to bring back the mind of the animal again. What we're going to do is we're going to gradually start reintroducing mechanisms between the S and the R, but only to the extent that those mechanisms are mandated by the data. So this is again following Morgan's canon. What, what Watson has effectively done, I think, is to say is that we have wiped away all of the excess unnecessary mentalism in psychology and, and, and brought us back down to the to the bare bones of the stimulus response chain. And we're applying that wherever it's gonna make sense. But what we're seeing from Tolman's research here, and I'll explain it in a minute, is that by itself, the stimulus response chain will not suffice to explain what his rats are doing. So now we're gonna to have to bump it up just a little bit. We're gonna to have to, to climb the ladder, just maybe one rung or two rungs to invoke some kind of higher level process. But that's it. We're only going to invoke that one process for this behavior. We're not going to start reintroducing mentalism again, like late 1800s psychology, right? We're going to keep it as simple and as straightforward as possible. And again, the simplicity is part of the law of parsimony from, from the logical positivists. Tolman says that his research on the cognitive map is a form of place learning where the rats are learning about the layout of the place of the maze. He says that they demonstrate insight into a problem. Look back to Kohler's research for chimpanzees in, ch in chimpanzees in chapter nine. He talks about their insight in solving problems, right? And again, we can think that Kohler's work with chimpanzees was obviously not behavioristic in its nature either. And Tolman here is invoking the concept of latent learning, which is reinforcing Guthrie's perspective that learning can occur even when we don't see performance occurring. So learning can occur inside the animal, but we don't see any evidence of it until later. And that's where the latent part comes in, is that, the, that, that performance happens later on, right? It's latent. The learning is there the whole time. We just don't see any evidence of it until some other point in time. And it's some other factor that determines whether the animal responds or performs, but the learning was already there. So the first example, pretty straightforward, is that Tolman has a bunch of rats and he divides them into two groups. One of those groups gets to spend some time roaming around in a maze. Now, this roaming around period is not an attempt to teach the rats anything. So they're not being reinforced for left turns and right turns. They're not learning the maze in any obvious explicit way, right? He's not trying to train them. He's just letting them roam around the maze. Now, if you're Watson, this is not learning to solve a maze because in order for that to happen, they have to be reinforced for a specific sequence of left and right turns. And this is not happening here, right? They're not learning that. They're, it's all just random roaming around in the maze. So if you're Watson, you would claim that these rats have not learned anything at all. It's not until you actually would start instituting some sort of conditioning procedures that you would be able to say that the rats are changing their behavior, and then they've learned. But now that, what, that, now that Tolman has these two groups of rats, the rats who have been given some free time to roam around the maze, and the other group of rats who are completely naive to the maze, who've never been exposed to it, now he's going to take these two groups of rats and he's gonna start teaching them to solve the maze. Well, guess which group learns faster? 
it's obviously the group that was exposed to the maze the first time. So what seems to be the case here is that there's only one way to explain the fact that this, uh, this one particular group can learn the maze faster. And it's something the fact about the fact that they must have learned something. They must have picked up something about the layout, the place, a cognitive map perhaps of the maze. Now, if that's not compelling enough, let's take a look at uh, Tolman's insight maze. This is where he's actually giving them a problem to solve, much like Kohler with the chimpanzees, giving them weird problems to solve, and then they just kind of appear to have insight and they solve the problem. Tolman does the same thing here. So here's a portion of a maze. This isn't the whole maze. This would just be one small portion of a much larger maze. And the rat would be coming in from the bottom where it says start, and, may, and, and so they've been already taught this maze, so they know how to solve it. And in this case, they know they just need to keep on going down this main corridor labeled path one. But what Tolman now does after they've learned to solve this maze is he places a roadblock at location A, which is right here, all right? Now, they've never faced this roadblock before, so they have, would not have learned to solve it. So now that they've hit an unexpected dead end, they have, only one recourse, which is to double back and, and now encountering the possibility of, of choosing a detour with of path two or of path three. If you're Watson, you would say that they have never learned to make this choice so that their response at this point would be purely random, a coin flip of sorts, trial and error. And if you had a hundred rats, you would expect that based on pure random you know, processes and, 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 and random chance, that about 50 of them would choose path two and 50 would choose path three. It would be 50-50, right? Well, that's not what Tolman found. Tolman found a statistically significant portion of his rats chose path two over path three, meaning greater than 50% chance, right? So, so this means that there's something about these rats that they know path two is the, is the better choice. It's clearly the shorter detour. Now, just to prove that maybe there isn't some particular other reason that they like path two. Maybe they just like path two for some other reason that's not related to the fact that they realize it's the short detour. So let's now repeat our experiment, but we're gonna place the block, the roadblock in at position B up here instead of position A. So now when they are faced with the roadblock farther on down the path one, as they come back here, and again faced with a choice to going down path two or path three, now the rats choose path three instead of path two. Again, a statistically significant portion of them do, greater than 50%. So this again tells us that apparently these rats know something about where these corridors go, and they're applying that knowledge to a novel problem, right? This is an example of insight in Tolman's uh, use here. So this does suggest that we do need to invoke some kind of a cognitive process to explain what the rats are doing. That we cannot simply just talk about stimulus and response, that we need some other psychological construct. So this is a good example of logical positivism and theory in psychology, right? Because now we're gonna have a cognitive map, which is not something that is, we, we can observe. So therefore it's a statement that goes beyond our observations but it is something that necessarily has to be invoked to explain what the rats are doing. So it's another good example here of, of using Morgan's canon that we do have to climb up the ladder to go above the stimulus response relationship. And now this is an idea that can be tested, right? And that's exactly what Tolman is doing is that having the idea of a cognitive map, the, this, this insight maze serves as a test to either verify or falsify, right? This theory is falsifiable because if the rats actually did exhibit random behaviors and chose path two and three at 50-50 at rates, that would falsify the idea of the cognitive map. But that's not what Tolman found. We also have Hull, who's also talking about intervening variables and using the concept of hypothetical deduction to say that we can do some scientific testing of things that are not otherwise observed, intervening variables that come between the stimulus and the response. Though he's not very much interested in cognitive processes, he's much more interested in biological processes. So this still places him into the domain of something that's a little bit closer to what Watson would be willing to accept because it's all biological stuff that we might actually be able to measure in some way. 
So an animal is faced with a stimulus and they're going to respond just like maybe Thorndike's cats faced with a puzzle box and they, they might respond or they might not. They might respond now, they might respond later. How can we predict whether or not they respond? This was the problem that Guthrie was really getting at, right? Well, what are those other factors that we can use to predict whether an animal responds to a stimulus or not, even though they've already learned to, to, that they can respond to that stimulus, will they? So what determines that? And this is where Hull wants to talk about the idea that there are many intervening variables that will determine whether an animal responds to a stimulus. And that we can combine these intervening variables into a statistical, uh, kind of like a, like a regression equation of sorts, assign weights to each one of them and calculate a total reaction potential. It's kind of like an R square in the regression, right? To predicting the likelihood of, of, of Y given X. Um, so drive, Hull is famous for his drive theory, right? So, so what we think of as a psychological motivation, he, he reduces to simple physiological drive states. So he talks about famously things, actually, let's just jump to the next slide where we have some stuff here. He talks about the idea that uh, the body is driven in a physiological way to maintain homeostasis, right? So if you've had the psychomotivation class, you learned about set points and homeostasis. And so all of these physiological processes like hunger and thirst and sexual arousal and body temperature and all these things are, are basically driven by homeostatic mechanisms in the hypothalamus. And that variations in, in, these, in these drive states, variations in homo, deviations from homeostasis primarily, uh, result in motivations, which are really now just behavioral tendencies to return the body to homeostasis, right? So we'll come back here to this uh, list of intervening variables. Drive state is something that will determine, right? So going back to Thorndike's cats, for example, how hungry are the cats? So of course, if the cat is feeling a great deal of hunger, they might escape the box faster than if they were not. If they were not hungry, they might be content to just sit there. So drive state determines the response. At least in part, it's one of many variables. Habit strength. So this is actually something of a restatement of the law of exercise, but it's a statement based on just purely habit. It's, instead of just talking about the learning getting stronger over time, here what Hull is talking about is just that the tendency to respond changes based on the number of times you've done it in the past. So there's a little complex equation here, one minus 10 to the power of X times N, where N refers to the total number of times you've done this in the past, right? The number of trials, the number of repetitions, and X is a coefficient because this habit strength can be different or the, or the effect of past experience may be different for different responses. So, so X will differ when it's, a funct when it's a, uh, an eating response versus some other response, for example. And then there's incentive motivation, which is what's the, th what's the thing that the animal's trying to get? So, you know, uh, Thorndike, for example, never varied the kind of food that was pre present outside the box. But the idea is that, that, a, that a cat may be more likely to escape the box if there is a very motivating kind of food right outside the box, gourmet cat food, right? Versus something else that it doesn't like or doesn't eat at all, right? So the idea here is that we could calculate the total reaction potential. In this given moment, what's the likelihood the cat will escape the box? We already know the cat has learned to escape the box, but will it? And here what we can do is we can say, well, if we know something about its drive state, its habit strength, and its incentive motivation, we could calculate those things and put numbers on them. We could calculate its drive state. If we were able to get at its, its physiology somehow, we might be able to determine this. And then we can determine habit strength just by keeping track of how many times it's escaped the box in the past. And then we could calculate incentive motivation if we knew something about the effect that this particular food that we're placing outside the box has on the cat's hunger, maybe the degree to which it satisfies the cat's hunger, right? The caloric or fat content of the food or something like that might play some role in the incentive motivation. And all those three things together could determine E, the total reaction potential. And now we would be able to provide a much more statistical 
uh, measurement of the cat's likelihood of the response. And we could apply this to any situation. We could say that in any given situation, if I put a stimulus in front of you, I could put a cheeseburger in front of a human being. And we could say that, okay, that's a stimulus and the response should be to eat it, but a person might eat it or might not eat it. And what's the likelihood of the response? Well, how hungry are they? What's their habit strength? Have they eaten cheeseburgers in the past? What's the incentive motivation? You know, what's the effect that this cheeseburger will have on their hunger? Think about hab habit strength here, because obviously, well, drive obviously is relevant because you, if you're not at all hungry, you're probably not going to eat it, right? But habit strength is, plays a big influence on, on human eating behaviors because if uh, there's something that you've never had before, it looks weird and different, you're maybe tentative to, to eat it because you're not quite sure what it is, what it will taste like, and all this kind of stuff, right? So, so all these kinds of factors influence all, you know, not just cats escaping the puzzle box or rats in mazes, but even humans in our every, regular everyday behavior. In fact, that's exactly what Hull wanted to do. He essentially believed that eventually this would be reducible to a deterministic process, that we have the stimulus, and so we talk about the stimulus response chain, but in between there, we have a few intervening variables, but it's all very mathematical, right? So we could essentially write equations of behavior that a given stimulus comes in, and then if we could quantify a bunch of other in, uh, intervening variables, uh, I would still be able to predict and control an animal's response here, right? So this would still take an approach to, to a, very, a very deterministic robotic approach to, to behavior. Um, so I have this little line here that says that humans would be robots, but not simple robots. So what that means is that a simple robot is one that just has stimulus response relationships that's been programmed with, right? And that's a Pavlovian way of describing behavior, or even if we could program a robot to do that, it would be a simplistic robot, right? But we also could have robots that have states, right? So, uh, so the idea is that we have complexity, Right. And, and we can now generate complexity of behavior by having robots that have all kinds of different uh, variables that can influence their behaviors. And so now there would be complex calculations that have to be performed before a robot would respond or not respond to a given stimulus. And that's the way we'll try to now talk about people is that we have lots of variables. So one way to think about this is that for Hull, the goal of psychology is not just to predict and control behavior, but it's to identify what are all of the intervening variables that are necessary to successfully predict and control behavior. So that's really the goal for psychology is to start identifying. Besides habit strength, drive state, and, and incentive motivation, what are all of the other intervening variables that, are might, that might be relevant for, for human behavior? And but that's going to be a complicated thing. But, you know, maybe it's not just three or four or five. Maybe it's 10, 20, 100, right? So now we're left with a situation where we might, in principle, be able to do that. And if we were able to do that, even if it was 100 different variables that need to be manipulated and controlled, we could, in principle, design an experiment where we would be able to manipulate and control all those variables and then successfully predict and control human behavior in the laboratory. And we would have succeeded then in kind of solving psychology if we could do that, right? We would know all of the variables that are relevant to a given response and we can control them and measure them and manipulate them. And we're going to be able to exactly predict what people do. The problem, of course, is that psychology has never succeeded in doing that. Of course, it's also possible that, or it's, or it's also re re real reality that this kind of behaviorism fell out of favor by the by the 1950s and 60s. So, so psychologists essentially stopped trying to do that. So it's possible that if we kept on going, maybe some some success would have been had. But but this has been long since abandoned as a way of trying to do psychology. But it raises the possibility, of course, that uh, that this kind of of um, mathematical variable driven uh, psychology. Could, could work, right? But this raises some other issues related to, the, to another is, uh, issue, artificial intelligence, AI. So if Hull is correct that we could identify all of these intervening variables that are relevant to predicting a response and that we can measure them and quantify them and, and, and develop an equation 
So we can connect the stimulus and the response with a bunch of numbers, and that would give us an equation that would predict behavior. We could, in principle, program that equation into a computer and make an actual robot, or at least a form of int computerized artificial intelligence that would respond to stimulus inputs. Now, this computer would be following this equation, which we would have argued would be the exact same equation that also governs human behavior. So now we have a, a biological human being that's behavior is governed by this equation, and then we have an artificial synthetic computer that also behaves according to the exact same equation. We can then ask the question, does that mean that this computer is intelligent in the same way a human is because its behavior is governed by the same underlying rules and principles and variables and mathematics? And if you're a behaviorist like Hull, the answer would be yes. That's all that intelligence is. Intelligence is not some dualistic, mentalistic thing, the special thing in our minds, right? Intelligence is really just the complexity of all the variables and the equations that govern our behavior. Humans are, and from a behaviorist perspective, humans are quote unquote more intelligent than other animal species only because our brains are more complicated and that means we have a little bit more complexity in our mathematics of our behavior, more variables in the equations perhaps. But it's not a, it's not a, it's not a fundamentally different thing, this intelligence that we have, right? This is associated with in the early days of AI in the 1940s and 50s when we had people like Alan Turing who, who was working in AI and giving us the, the very beginnings of, of computer science and cybernetics, which we'll talk about in the next chapter a little bit too. The, the so-called Turing test for AI. How do we evaluate if we had a machine that was actually uh, artificially intelligent, could we evaluate that it really was intelligent. Could, how could we do that? This, um, and of course, you know, the, what the Turing test is set up to do is, is uh, it's kind of like doing an instant messaging chat with, uh, with a computer. And your job as the, as the person here is to interview the computer and try to determine whether or not it's really a machine or it could be a real person. So one way, this, imagine setting this up is that you're simultaneously doing an instant messaging chat with two entities at the same time. One is a computer and the other is a real life human being. And you ask questions of both of them and you try to figure out which is which. And if you're successful at this, maybe the computer, for example, seems to be giving you answers that don't seem to be um, the right answers or something that feels canned about them as if it's got just a set number of pre-programmed responses and it's just giving them to you even though it's not quite the exact right answer to the question you're asking. It just seems to be the computer's best attempt at answering your question. It fails the test, so to speak, right? It becomes easy to determine which one is the computer and which is the, which is the real person. And so for, therefore we've failed the Turing test. It's, the, the, the machine does not appear intelligent. Its behavior does not appear to be complex enough or natural enough or variable enough or complicated enough to appear intelligent. And therefore it's not intelligent and we know it's not. And we say that's got to be a computer. But if we are able to improve this computer to the point that we cannot pick, we, 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 we become fooled, and it then passes the Turing test, we're still left with the, with the question, now that it has passed the Turing test, does that mean that it's really intelligent? From a behaviorist perspective, the answer to that again is yes. Right, that that's, that's all that there is to intelligence is just complexity of responding. And once you build in enough complexity and flexibility uh, uh, and robustness to the way in which the computer responds to different kinds of stimulation, then you have effectively simulated intelligence and it's, that's all that it is, is just that kind of robustness and being able to, to respond and handle different kinds of inputs and still respond in ways that appear human-like. But from another perspective also, though, we think that that doesn't feel satisfactory, right? We, we, we feel that, well, even though the computer is just responding, it doesn't really understand what it's doing. But humans understand what they're doing. When they, when they are faced with things, stimulation, we, we understand what it is. 
But we have to realize, of course, that that's not a behaviorist way of explaining behavior to, to talk about the necessity of understanding what we, what we do. Again, going back to the behaviorist manifesto, we don't need to talk about goals and understanding to explain why people do what they do. We just need to be able to explain it by stimulus response. Speaking of that kind of stimulus response, very simplistic rejection of the mind uh, uh, kinds of theories we get are big name in behaviorism, right? Skinner. Skinner is saved for the end, uh, and it can maybe is considered a neo-behaviorist of sorts, only because his theory is a little different because he doesn't use the Pavlovian stimulus response approach. Instead, he uses what we call operant conditioning instead of classical conditioning, where it's the response comes first and then it's followed by a stimulus. And in fact, it's, it's pretty similar to Thorndike's method of the law of effect, right? Where the animals have to learn the consequence of their action. And that's what operant conditioning is about. But instead of using a puzzle box, he uses what's called the Skinner box. Actually, he calls it an operant chamber. Uh, he didn't like the term Skinner box, uh, but, but that's what everyone else called it. He has initially studying rats and he was studying lever pressing behaviors of rats. Um, he, he replaced that though. He, 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 did, he realized that it was easier to train pigeons to peck on a key or a disc, as you can see in this picture down at the bottom. And this is a good example of behaviorism here because we might think, oh, does that mean that pigeons are smarter than rats because it's easier to train them to perform these responses? They can learn faster, right? But uh, Skinner, as a, as a strict behaviorist, would not entertain this kind of question, right? He, he, that would require knowledge that he doesn't have. And, and so he would essentially say, what I can tell you is that pigeons are faster at, perform, at learning these responses and therefore more useful to study in the laboratory. But to explain why is not something that we have any data to support, at least not yet. So therefore, um, he would not make, make a, an attempt to explain it in terms of something that we would call intelligence, right? When I say that, that he's less cold-hearted than Watson about this, and I think it's just because of the idea that the, that the operant theory is a little more active rather than the passive part of classical conditioning. If you remember back to chapter five, we talked about the fact that uh, John Stuart Mill you know, grew up the son of James Mill, is, who was sort of a proto-behaviorist and was very passive in his approach to learning and therefore child development. And, and John Stuart Mill grew up to be depressed. And then Watson also taking a similar approach to child development. His sons grew up to be depressed. Skinner, on the other hand, taking that more active learning approach, um, his daughters grew up to be not depressed, pretty happy and healthy and well-adjusted as far as all the stories go. But Skinner still very much a behaviorist, eliminating the mind and saying that the things that we think of as complex behaviors, going back to Jennings and his, his attempt to climb the ladder of Morgan's Cannon, um, Skinner wants to take us right back to the bottom of the ladder, right back to the stimulus response relationship here, and says that the things that appear to be complex are only apparently complex. It's an illusion of sorts, right? That you can strip complex behaviors down into a sequence of simpler responses that have all been chained together. And so, so complexity is now shaped by chaining together sequences of simpler responses into a, a bigger behavior. But the, be, but the more complex behavior really is reducible down to simpler components. So let's have a look at uh, Skinner's theory, right? So you've got the classic uh, classical conditioning here, S followed by R, right? That's, the, that's Pavlovian conditioning. It's passive because the animal doesn't do anything until the stimulus occurs, and then they have to respond to the stimulus. But Skinner's theory is active because the response comes first. So in the absence of a stimulus, the animal will respond, and then something will happen. And then that something, which is the consequence of stimulus, uh, will affect the likelihood of whether that response will be repeated again in the future. So it's reminiscent of the law of effect. But what's crucial here is that whereas Thorndike was talking about rewards as things that shape behavior and influence the likelihood of a response, 
Skinner doesn't use that re word, right? He uses reinforcement. And it's very important that we make sure we keep that distinction between reward and reinforcement. Reward means to satisfy a need or a desire. And that's when we start talking about these mentalistic things happening inside the animal. What do they want? Reinforcement does not have that connotation, right? Reinforcement just means to strengthen. So what counts as a reinforcement does not mean something is rewarding because it's, we're not making any assumptions about whether it satisfies a goal, right? So for Skinner, the definition of reinforcement is merely an operational definition. We don't a priori think that any particular stimulus is likely to be a reinforcer. We determine this after the fact. If, if an animal performs a response and then we apply a particular stimulus as a consequence, and as a result of that, the animal's behavior increases, we have now discovered that this stimulus is a reinforcer. And so it's a reinforcer because we have observed it is a reinforcer operationally. We have no reason to explain why, and we don't need to explain why. So there's another classic behavioristic thing here where he, Skinner's really being a positivist at this point, right? He's not developing theoretical explanations of any of this stuff. It merely is a fact that whatever this variable or the stimulus is, it reinforces behavior with no attempt to explain why. Meanwhile, other, other stimuli may actually decrease behavior, which then by definition makes them punishments. And again, we don't attempt to explain why, it just is. So in this case, now we end up with different kinds of reinforcements and punishment, the famous breakdown of positive, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishment as well. Avoid the connotations there. Positive and negative seem like good and bad, right? But that's not what he means here. Positive just means to apply the stimulus. Negative means to take away the stimulus. So positive reinforcement, the animal does something. A pigeon pecks on the key. They get food. Food is likely to be a reinforcement. So in this case, that's positive reinforcement. They do something, then they get something in, 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 uh, as a consequence. We've applied the food to the stimulus as a, as a consequence of the, to the response. But negative reinforcement, right? That could be a situation like, let's, let's imagine we have electrified the cage floor and that pigeon is, is, is occasionally receiving an electric shock to their feet from the floor of the Skinner box. If they peck on the key and that turns the shock off, they're going to peck more often. That makes it reinforcement, right? But it's not the shock that was reinforcing, it's the removal of the shock. So that makes that negative reinforcement. Punishment, any, anything that decreases the behavior. So if the pigeon pecks and then they get shocked, that was an application of a stimulus and now they're gonna peck less often probably, right? So now you got positive punishment. Sounds like an oxymoron, but not if you think of it in terms of just applying the stimulus. And then likewise, negative punishment. Maybe if you take away the pigeon's food, and they have, maybe they have free access to a tray of food, but if they peck on the disc, the tray is removed from the Skinner box, they're gonna peck less often probably now, right? So now you get negative punishment. You've taken something away and that decreases their behavior. Another important discovery from Skinner is that when it comes to actually shaping behavior, punishment is actually not effective. So Skinner was really not a, an advocate of using punishment as a way of things like behavior modification uh, techniques, but reinforcement is very effective in his argument. And so he went, set about uh, doing a lot of studies trying to figure out what's the best way of reinforcing behavior. If you really want to cause a change in behavior, a very large change in behavior, what's the best way to do it? There are different schedules or rates of reinforcement. So you could have, for example, continuous reinforcement, that's when you reinforce every single response. And as it turns out, continuous reinforcement is important when it comes to learning new responses, but it's not necessarily the most efficient way to get a large number of responses. Imagine, for example, you're teaching your dog to sit. You want to, you want to continuously reinforce every time they obey the command sit. But if you want them to continue sitting all the time, every time you, you give them a command, you don't want to have to do that, right? You don't want to have to carry a a bunch of treats around in your pocket to continuously reinforce their, their obeyance. So various other schedules might be more useful, right? So we can break down our schedules here in terms of these two categories. There's the interval versus ratio uh, category. 
interval means that reinforcement is occurring based on some sort of time intervals, right? Ratio refers to the fact that the reinforcement occurs based on a certain number of responses. And then there's the category of fixed versus variable. So fixed interval means that reinforcement is occurring based on a fixed amount of time. This is as simple as basically imagining a situation where the pigeon in the Skinner box is, is, is reinforced based on some timer, right? So they have to peck, but it doesn't matter how many times they peck, they're going to get uh, uh, reinforced. If you set the timer to one minute, then that means that they get food every minute on the minute, regardless of how many times they peck. And as you can, might imagine, they don't peck very often because they don't have to, right? But the variable interval is a different one. So now what happens is that the timer is set to a random number every time. So, so maybe the first interval is one minute long and they have to peck at least one time in that interval and then the timer is gonna go off and, and after one minute. But after that first interval elapses, now the timer gets reset to a new random time, maybe not a minute, but maybe it's a minute 20 seconds, right? It's not gonna be drastically different. It's not gonna jump from a minute to five hours, right? It's gonna change 10 or 15 seconds or 20 seconds or something like that. What happens is that in this case, the pigeons act in unpredictable ways but they do increase their rate of pecking. And what he found is that they will occasionally exhibit random flurries of pecking, that they will sometimes be pecking and nothing happens, and then they'll sometimes be pecking and then the timer just happens to go off. And then what happens is that the pigeons begin to act as if there is a contingency, that there's a conditional relationship between their pecking behavior and the fact that the timer went off at that time. And pigeons peck more and more often. And, and Skinner compared this to superstitious behavior. In fact, wrote a paper called Superstition and the Pigeon. And what he's arguing here is that this is a lot like what we consider superstitious behavior in people, that sometimes we happen to be doing something and then something else happens at the same time that is pure coincidence, as in the case of the pigeon pecking and the timer going off. But we perceive that there is a relationship there, right? This is called an illusory correlation. And we think that because of the correlation of the two events that there's a causal thing happening, but there's not. But when you act like with superstition, you think that, you know, this behavior brings me good luck, right? Because it just happened at one point in time to coincide with something good happening to you. But of course, that was correlational in nature. It wasn't causal. And so now the pigeons are acting like that as well. And they now increase their pecking even though there's no reason for them to increase their pecking. It will not result in them being fed more often, but they do, they act like it does, right? And so Skinner's trying to make an argument that when people do these kinds of things that we would label superstitious behavior, it's because we think it gives, gets these reinforcements more often, but it doesn't really. Then the ratio schedule is where the number of re reinforcement is based on how many responses are performed. So a fixed ratio is, just means that you, the pigeon has to peck a certain number of times. Maybe it's 10 times or 15 times, right? But the idea is that they get reinforced every time they hit that number. One of the things that Skinner tried to do with this was to see how much, he, how big he could get this number. So will they peck 15 times before reinforcement? Yes. Will they, will they peck 25 times between reinforcements? Yes. 50? Sure. 100? Yeah, sure. They would peck 100 times and then, you know, get reinforced. But what about 1,000? 5,000? 10,000? Will they go that high between reinforcements? And there the answer is no. They won't do that. But then there's the variable ratio. So with the variable ratio, what happens is that they have to peck a certain number of times, again, maybe 10 to start. But then the next reinforcement occurs after some new random number. It's not going to jump from 10 to 10,000, but it might go from 10 to 12, and then from 12 to 9, and then from 9 to 11, and then from 11 to 14, and then from 14 to 12 again, right? So, so the number just keeps jumping around randomly. But Skinner would gradually increase the, the ratio to get it to 50, 55, 60, 52, and so forth, right? And then up to 100, 107, 99, you know, all around in there. How high could he get it? 5,000? 10,000? 20,000? Yes, he really did. He was actually able to get the pigeons to peck 10 to 20,000 times between reinforcements. And of course, in order to get them there, 
He would have to work them up gradually, though, through 1,000 and 2,000 and 5,000 and 8,000 and so forth. And so he literally had these pigeons pecking hundreds of thousands of times uh, over the course of hours, right? Uh, they were wearing their beaks down. And so this is clearly the, the, the schedule that led to the highest rate of responding, right? The variable ratio. It has some pretty obvious uh, corollaries to human behavior, things like gambling, for example, like playing slot machines. It's a variable ratio schedule, right? Because it's based on how many times you play. It's not how long you sit there. It's how many times you pull, put a coin in and pull the lever, right? Um, and of course, assuming it's not fixed, then it's, then it's, actually, it's a random process that determines uh, how often you you win a jackpot, and um, of course people are then known to be to be you know to, we observe people in the in the casino they're going to sit there for hours right they just play and play and play and play and they spend all their money, very high rate of responding. Okay, one last thing real quick that we want to do to talk about Skinner here is is a, is a little bit of social stuff. So so in addition to his experimental psychology, Skinner was famous for the fact that he believed that. Uh, all sciences, psychology included, should be uh, uh, applied in nature. And we should be applying what we know about science to improve the human condition and to develop technologies centered around this, the, what we have found. And so Skinner tried to do this for psychology as well, to apply psychological knowledge to create things. If we know something about learning, maybe we should design some technologies that are good for learning, right? So he did some stuff like that. He, he uh, invented first, let's talk about the baby tender or the air crib. Here's a picture of one of his daughters in this. This was actually called the air crib when he tried to, to, to manufacture and sell these things. He didn't want to call it the baby tender because he didn't intend for it to be something that took care and tended to your children for you, right? Um, but it was designed to help making childcare uh, a lot easier while also providing a stimulating environment for children where they can operate on their environment, right? There are things for them to do inside the, 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 the air crib. And of course, it's climate controlled. That's why it's called the air crib and everything. Um, but, you know, funnily enough, you know, people knew who Skinner was back then in the, in the 50s and 60s. He was pretty famous as a psychologist. And people also had, though, a somewhat negative perception of behaviorism. It was seen, you know, just as like this predict and control stuff as being a little bit sinister. And Watson didn't have a very good name either, you know, from the public perception of him with the whole little Albert experiment and all that sort of stuff. And so people looked at this thing and they thought, is this a Skinner box for my baby? I don't want to put my baby in a Skinner box, right? So nobody bought these things. And so this was a, a big failure uh, for Skinner. Go back to the previous slide here at the bottom, the teaching machine. So another example, again, an educational thing for learning. If we're going to have some applied learning theory, Skinner knew that if you want to increase behavior, you need to reinforce a response. But those reinforcements should occur immediate. They should be immediately after the response. And in uh, school work, the idea is that what's happening is that children will turn in their homework. That's the response we want to reinforce, right, is them doing their homework. But the thing is, is that it's, they do their homework and then they turn it in the next day. So then there's this delay. And then of course the teacher takes days to grade it and then it comes back. And so there's this long delay between doing the response and getting the feedback is, which should be the reinforcement, getting a little gold star or an A on your paper, right? So he designed this idea of a teaching machine where, ch where children could be presented with their questions on a screen and then key in answers. This is before when digital computers would be of the scale where you could have them in, in classrooms. So this is more of a mechanical machine where you could have an equivalent kind of process where you can answer questions and key in answers and get immediate feedback, right? Um, this didn't quite work out either just because of limitations to the technology, but the basic logic of it makes a lot of sense, of course, that we would um, have that immediate feedback and that, that, that at least makes some sense. Nowadays, the prevalence of computerized education and uh, things of that nature probably reinforce some of Skinner's basic ideas there. Here's another interesting one, the Project Pigeon. So this, if you can't tell, is the nose cone of a missile. So Skinner, like many psychologists, uh, you know, active during World War II and was involved in a little bit of work during World War II in terms of uh, helping out the military effort. And one of the things that was a bit of a drawback when it came to how things worked in, in the war was 
carpet bombing, right? We didn't have guided missiles during World War II. And so in order to take out a target, what you have to do is you have to fly a squadron of B-52 bombers over your target and just drop bombs everywhere, All right? So you, you, they, you, you wanna take out a factory, but in order to take out the factory, you're just dropping bombs as many as you can all over this general area. So you're gonna take out a lot of other targets as well, and a lot of collateral damage, right? And you may or may not even completely destroy your intended target. So it would be nice if you'd have a guided missile. So Skinner came up with the idea of a pigeon steered missile, strangely enough, right? So what you have here is a situation where you've got this nose cone and you've got these three little chambers here and you would put a pigeon in each one of these chambers and in front of them would be this little screen, which is actually a little bit like the key that they would learn to peck on in front of the, in the, in the, in the, in the Skinner box, right? And there would be crosshairs that they would be able to see can't really see it in the photograph here. And the idea is that if the crosshairs would drift to the left, they would be trained to peck on the right. And then by pecking on the right, what that actually does is it actually turns a little uh, a controller in here that steers the missile. And that's gonna cause the crosshairs to drift back to center. And so each pigeon is trained to peck either on the left or right side of their, of their disc to keep the crosshairs centered. You have to have three of them because the, pigeon, the, the missiles are steered on three axes of rotation. You've got the pitch, roll, and yaw of the, of the missile. And each, each pigeon is controlling a different axis. And Skinner actually succeeded in getting funding from the Department of Defense to test some prototypes of these things. And they actually worked. Um, but probably fortunately for pigeons everywhere, because of course the pigeons are flying to their own doom here. Um, it wasn't too long after that, that, that uh, other people invented computer guidance systems for, for missiles and therefore you didn't have to use countless pigeons to, to steer bombs. But we see what he's doing. Last, and if, this, and if that last one wasn't controversial, this one is the, probably the most controversial thing Skinner ever did. He wrote two books that amount to social commentary. So keep in mind that Skinner is a deterministic behaviorist, right? He doesn't believe in free will. And if we really stop to think about what that means as far as society is concerned, then that really means that humans have no free control over their own behavior and their own choices. And that means things like criminals, for example, do not commit crime because of their evil psychological character or their personality or any of that kind of stuff, they've been shaped by their experiences, right? So this means that this changes the way we have to think about things like personal responsibility. People are not responsible for their own behavior if you're a strict behaviorist like Skinner. Rather, people engage in these kinds of behaviors because they've been shaped by society to become criminals. That means something has happened to them in their past that will explain why they do what they do. And we simply just need, as a, as a society, as a psychologist especially, to understand what those processes are. But we would also need to realize here that these people are not responsible. And therefore, the function of the criminal justice system would change drastically because it would mean that we would not need to be focused on punishment and retribution for crimes, but rather it would be based on shaping behavioral change, behavior modification, and rehabilitation to unlearn all of the previous criminal learn responses and replace that with more positive socially uh, contributing behaviors instead. So what Skinner is arguing here is that he, basic concepts in our society like personal responsibility, freedom, liberty, justice, all of those things are false and illusory. They don't exist. And that we would need a society that instead of being focused on the Bill of Rights and all of the basic libertarian stuff and freedom, it needs to be focused on the fact that it needs that we need to have a society governed by behaviorists, essentially. We need to recognize the fact that the people in a society are shaped by the social institutions of that society, the government, the schools, all of that stuff. And that it all it needs to be designed to shape people to becoming uh, contributing members of society. It's a very top-down approach to social institutions, right? Based on government shaping citizens. Clearly runs completely at odds with everything that is central to, to American society. So you can imagine the kinds of, of uh, um, criticisms that he was subjected to. 
So the two books here, the first was actually a fiction book called Walden Two, meant to be a sequel to Thoreau's uh, utopian novel, where Skinner writes a utopian uh, uh, society here that's governed by behaviorists. This was in, written in the 60s, actually, and it was very common in the 60s for the hippies, in particular in the counterculture movement, to, to move off somewhere and actually create communes. And there were at least two communes created based on the principles that were described in Walden II, and one of them in Mexico still exists to this day, 50 some years later. So that's kind of an interesting uh, consequence of what Skinner was doing, uh, that there are people still doing what he described there. Uh, the second book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, was really more of a nonfiction social commentary in which he's really kind of explaining this more at an intellectual level uh, to, to, to argue for why concepts like freedom, dignity, responsibility are false concepts. Um, didn't really catch on as a popular idea in society, but we can at least, I think it's important to realize what some of the social implications of behaviorism are, that if we really adopt this deterministic view, and that certainly changes the way in which we have to view these kinds of concepts. Skinner was well aware of that and took it seriously and tried to write about it to not very much success. Anyway, that's the end of our chapter 13. We will move on to cognitive psychology, which is the big deal that replaces, chapter, that replaces behaviorism in the mid 20th century.